Hi everybody, welcome back to IndyCar and today I promise you it is the 14th of August today because I think yesterday I said it was the 14th when it really was the 13th so oh, I'm just going to check it. Yeah, definitely the 14th today. Well, today I'm going to devote the entire program to the Labour Party which is a bit of a change for me because it's usually something to do with the Tories or uh, maybe the SNP but very rarely do I do an entire program now, completely given over to what's going on with Labour. Now, as you probably know, Labour's in a bit of a mess because recently John MacDonald, who is British Labour's shadow chancellor, was appearing at the Edinburgh Fringe in a kind of talk show format where he was answering questions from the audience. And although he, let's, to put it... To put it uh, mildly, he's not really been a politician when he's on this show. He's he's actually on holiday. So if you imagine that um, the shadow chancellor has taken his politician's hat off, taken his political clothes off, as it were, and he's sat on that stage and he's answered questions as himself. So he's not really uh, subject to any party whips or party lines or having to say what he's told. And during that Edinburgh Festival Fringe event, he was asked if Labour would stand in the way of a second independence referendum, and his answer was very simple. No, it wouldn't. He said that Labour would not stand in the way of a second independence referendum, that he didn't see that there would be any benefit to that, uh, and that the Scots have a right to vote on their own self-determination. Now, that was his opinion, and he's perfectly entitled to hold that, and in theory, that really doesn't have anything to do with Labour Party policy. But having said it, caused a tremendous stir, particularly in Scottish Labour, where Richard Leonard, who is, and let's face it, he, he's an English former trade unionist who's been parachuted in to lead the Labour Party in Scotland. Like a lot of, um, shall we say, British unionist-style parties, they often will put their junior politicians into the Scottish Parliament to kind of cut their teeth and get some experience of actually being a politician uh, and being an opposition. Now, Richard Leonard is okay. I mean, he's okay as a politician, but he's a typical Labour politician. He says typically Labour things, and he uh, he goes with the party line. He never deviates from what he's told to say. Richard Leonard got very hot under the collar with John MacDonald for saying that the Labour Party would not block a second independence referendum because Labour in Scotland's policy was the opposite of that, was to say there's no, not going to be any a new referendum on independence, very much echoing almost exactly word for word what Ruth Davidson's party, uh, the Conservative Party in Scotland, was also saying. I'll come back to Ruth Davidson in a moment, there's actually a connection here as well. So we've got main Labour Party in London saying one thing, so one of the senior heavy hitters in the Labour's front bench is saying that he believes the Labour Party would not block uh, a Scottish independence referendum, a second one, if there was to, if there was one to be held. Now that's interesting because this morning um, a spokesperson from Labour, I can't remember the woman's name, she was on the breakfast show this morning and she was talking about um, the clearing system, the, the, way that, the way in which uh, young people are allocated university places and why it was unfair. But on the back of that interview, she was directly asked by the host of the programme would Labour uh, block a second independence referendum in Scotland? Now, it's interesting that this came on the back of a completely different topic, nothing to do with Scottish independence, but it was asked. And her response was interesting. She said the Labour Party position was that they didn't see the need for a second independence referendum. She very carefully avoided saying that Labour would block it. But she did elaborate a little bit. She said she didn't believe that Labour would ever legislate to block a second independence referendum. Now that is a, a little bit more of a clarification, if you need one, on Labour's rather muddled position on everything, basically. But what has added more, um, shall we say, um, more spice to this story, some more interest to this story, is the discovery this morning by several um, bloggers online, independence bloggers online, I can't remember exactly who it was he found out first, that a quick scan on Company's house, he discovered that uh, the Richard Leonard's relatives, we're not sure exactly which one at the moment, has registered a new 
uh, company at Companies House, and it's called the Scottish Labour Party Limited, and it was just been uh, literally just listed on in Companies House in Edinburgh, uh, and I believe it was listed on about the 9th of August. So it's a very new thing, and this is a Scottish Labour Party Limited, a limited company, limited by guarantee, okay, but not a charity, not a charitable company whose business is. Um, activities of a political nature. Now the person who set this up, this is a little bit unclear, but it's believed that the person who set this party up is a female relative of Richard Leonard's, perhaps a sister, older sister, or uh, in-laws of Richard Leonard. And uh, this person, Ms. Leonard, is, is named as the CEO. Uh, and another uh, member of Richard Leonard's extended family is the uh, finance um, director of this tiny little uh, postbox company. Right, so a letterbox company, a shell company, has been set up called Scottish Labour Limited. Now, why would Richard Leonard do that? Unless he knows something, either, and this is the, these are the things that people are talking about this morning, either the Labour Party is attempting to create a Scottish only image for themselves in order to try to steal some of, shall we say, the left-leaning SNP independence vote from the SNP at a possible Holyrood election. Or, which I think is far more likely, that they see the writing on the wall. And they know now, because the Labour Party has pretty much said so, that Labour is not going to block a second independence referendum. If they ever did get into power, which is debatable and possibly unlikely, but if they did, and the SNP was a major uh, power broker, in other words, they gave Labour enough support to govern, then an independence referendum could be negotiated with Labour and they wouldn't block it. And that is a position that Labour wants to be in, because they need uh, to be able to negotiate with the SNP if they are to command some kind of majority in the House, if there was a general election and if they could win it, which are all, it's a whole lot of ifs there. But the interesting thing is that uh, Leonard's family is doing this on the quiet, it's not Richard Leonard himself, one of his relatives, in fact several of his relatives, have set this up and it is addressed at a small derelict shop in Crow Road in the west end of Glasgow. In fact, I pass by it every day. It's a derelict shop. It's owned by one of Leonard's family who also owns a, a, an outdoor pursuit business which also shares the same address but doesn't seem to use that address. So it's a very peculiar uh, development this morning that it appears that the Labour Party is secretly setting up a registered office in Scotland in advance of either trying to do, uh, trying to steal some votes during a Holyrood, uh, refer uh, a Holyrood election or in order that they can, uh, sorry, in, or in order that, that they can be seen as being a different party. In other words, if, if Scotland becomes independent, the Labour Party would survive and will be able to field candidates at the newly independent Scottish Parliament because after independence, no Scottish Parliament would permit uh, parties from a foreign country to stand uh, any candidates in their elections. It would be stupid. I mean, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't allow, for example, I mean, that if you think about it, you wouldn't allow, say, a, a, a French MP or something like that to come and stand in Westminster when he doesn't actually live in England and doesn't have anything to do with the UK. So, I mean, it would be stupid for, for an independent Scotland to allow uh, politicians from a foreign country's party system to stand for Holyrood. But this seems to be a pattern that's developing. In previous weeks, Ruth Davidson had the rug pulled out from under her by Lord Ashcroft's blockbuster poll, which showed that there was a 52% majority now in favour of independence in Scotland, and that 53%, uh, sorry, 51% of people uh, I think, thought that that independence referendum should be very soon. So Ruth Davidson, having said for weeks and months that there was no appetite in Scotland for another referendum and there was no support for it, been completely wrong-footed by her own party's donor. And that leaves Ruth Davidson in a situation where Murdo Fraser, one of her henchmen, if you like, 
has actually suggested that the Tory party breaks away, the Scottish Tory party, breaks away from the main Conservative party in London and perhaps drop the word unionist from their title. So it seems that both the major parties from England are now beginning to look at Scotland in a different way. And it's possible, I'm not saying it's likely, but it's possible that they are viewing the future through the lens of Scotland being independent. And all the, uh, all the political runes, if you like, all, all the things that predict the future in politics are beginning to coalesce and point towards and focus upon this no-deal Brexit happening. As we speak, um, a Scottish judge is about to rule on whether it is legal for Boris Johnson to prorogue Parliament, to close Parliament down temporarily long enough for him to force through a no-deal Brexit so that politicians in Westminster cannot do anything to stop it. Now that judge uh, in the Scottish, I'm trying to remember which court it is, Scottish High Court, I'll, I'll check, but anyway, Scottish Court is making a decision on whether the case against Boris Johnson warrants further scrutiny and I think he's looking for further evidence to be lodged before September the 3rd and that means eventually this will end up at the, the English government Supreme Court which will decide whether Boris Johnson can legally do that or not. This is the same group incidentally of MPs, uh, 70 of them cross parties all over Britain who got together to find out whether Britain could legally uh, and easily cancel out Brexit and revoke Article 50 at any time and they discovered that it could be done. It's not something which can't be reversed. Same group of people now are attempting to stop Boris Johnson from dragging the UK out by closing Parliament down temporarily using his extraordinary powers uh, and forcing through no deal. But if no deal happens then it's inevitable that there must, or if, if no deal is going to happen, it's inevitable that Scotland must vote for independence because there is no other solution to this problem. It's intractable. The only way out of it is for Scotland to leave the United Kingdom completely uh, and to find its own trading arrangement with Europe, whatever it is, either a full membership or uh, the EFTA, the European Free Trade uh, Association, whatever it is. But that's the only way out for Scotland if no deal is going to happen and if it cannot be stopped. And it is at the moment on the brink now of being unstoppable. If this court action fails, then Boris Johnson will be able to do what he's promised to do, which is to drag us out of the European Union without a deal. And all the rhetoric that's coming out of him today about uh, Remain parties somehow colluding with Europe, in other words, some kind of pre-planned... Uh, some kind of pre-planned strategy was arranged between the Remain MPs who were uh, trying to stop Brexit and the British Parliament. Boris Johnson is claiming that this is somehow a pre-arranged strategy by, by Brussels and the Remain MPs uh, to stop Britain from, uh, from getting its own way and to cut the fact that Britain can't really negotiate anything. Boris still is trying to convince us that there is the possibility of negotiation here is wrong. I mean, it, it, it's a fallacy. There is no way the European Union will negotiate. It has spent three years negotiating an exit deal which fits within the very narrow boundaries which the Conservative Party has set and which British, I should say, mostly English voters have set. These red lines, there must not be free movement of people, etc. Once those red lines are in place, there's only one exit deal that you can have, and it's already been negotiated, and the European Union will not change its mind. The backstop in Ireland, the thing that Boris Johnson wants removed, is a fundamental condition set by the EU for that trade deal. If that isn't met, the deal is off, basically. It is a condition that says that if Britain leaves in an orderly fashion with this agreement, it is then obliged to find a solution to the border problem as it's exiting. Later on, it has to come up with a solution. And the European Union was giving the UK time to find that solution. And the idea of the backstop was to force the British government to actually come up with a solution to the border. If you remove the backstop, Britain pulls itself out of the European Union without anybody's agreement, without paying any money that it owes to anybody else. 
It destroys the Good Friday Agreement, an international peace treaty, in the process and throws Ireland into complete chaos. And Ireland is one of the biggest export markets for UK goods that there is. And it's going to be destroyed by the very country which wants to export to Ireland or import from Ireland. So the way things are looking at the moment is that the British parties north of the border are beginning to think that they might end up being parties in an independent Scotland and that they now need to consider how they set their parties up and how they separate themselves from what is going on in London and from the, their parent parties in London. I think we are seeing the end game. We're beginning to see the strands that are holding, the last threads that are holding Scotland to England beginning to break now. And when party bonds between Scottish uh, branches of British parties and the parents snap like this, then you can tell that the writing is on the wall. And I think that's where we're at at the moment. I still stand by what I said the other day, that we must now have a referendum. If this court decision goes against the Remainers, if you like, if it goes against the 70 MPs who have petitioned to have this examined and to stop Boris Johnson from illegally proroguing Parliament and dragging us out of the uh, European Union without any deal whatsoever, if that goes wrong and it fails, there must be an independence referendum immediately because anything else will be too late. Johnson is very obviously working mostly for a deal with America. He is in the pocket of the Americans. The Americans are at the moment destabilizing much of Europe. They're trying to destabilize China at the moment because they are in a trade war with China. They see Europe as a major competitor. They see the petrodollar falling in value and the Americans are scared and so they've come out fighting. And Trump is the front uh, line for that. He's the man who speaks for them. So that's where we're at. It's a dangerous part of our history. We're entering one of the most critical periods now in the history of these islands. And I think it's very, very important that we all know exactly what's going on now and what is beginning to happen, or the first indications of it, are the separation of British parties in London from their branches in Scotland. And when that starts to happen, you know that something is starting to go wrong in Britain. You know that the bonds are starting to break. I'll leave you with that thought today. I'll see you later. Oh, by the way, um, I just wanted to make a shout out for the Sir Alba uh, pipe bands, uh, pipe and, pipes and drums. They're heading over to Catalonia uh, in the very near future to play there uh, with the Catalans outside the jail where the Spanish government is holding Catalan uh, members of parliament as political prisoners. So the Sir Alba pipes have been in pipes and drums have been invited over before, but it was difficult for all of them to get over there. So they're having a crowdfund appeal. I said I would try uh, to get a mention, and I nearly forgot this week, so I apologise. So please, if you can spare a few quid, go to the Sir Alba pipes and drums. Uh, homepage, they have a Facebook page and you can donate there. I'm sure they'll be glad of any help that you can give. I will be uh, presenting Scotland at 7 this evening uh, for a number of reasons. I've had to switch my shifts with uh, Kenny, our other presenter, but I'll be on tonight on Scotland at 7 on Broadcasting Scotland, live streaming and on YouTube. So tune in then and I'll see you later today. Bye bye.